puppet at ESPN. So we wanted to give this talk because at the end of last year um, at ESPN we were looking for a way to really get all our configurations under control. Everything that we had was really done manually. We just get emails from teams saying, hey, I need this, I need that, and we had to configure it. Um, actually, to give you a little more background, um, I'm with our Linux and middleware services team, so everything I'm going to be talking today is focused on Linux and middleware. I personally focus on the, the Java layer, um, not so much as a sysadmin, but more of the, the developer role. But we work together on a team to do everything from the OS layer all the way up through um, the applications. And just to get a feel for the audience here, how many people are, are just looking or investigating Puppet um, to implement? don't actually have anything up and running yet. And then how many people have stuff already implemented and maybe looking for some new ideas? And do, do we have any managers in the audience? Okay, the decision makers that stay out of the technical gobbledygook. All right. Um, th there should be a lot of good information here for everybody in those aspects. Um, so the way, I've, the way I've set it up this presentation, I'm going to talk about the challenges that ESPN faced first, and then we're going to look at the objective that we wanted to achieve coming out of our public implementation. Um, and then specifically about the implementation, we're going to look at how we set up our data structures, and then how we do our classification. And then the real fun part, we'll get into M Collective and talk about our IT agility. OK, so first of all, our challenges. Um, my team is very small. We have four people, essentially two people that do Java and middleware, and then two people that are sysadmins that do the OS. And we were experiencing um, a lot of rapid growth. We had a lot of servers moving over from the Windows world. And so we had four people. Um, we more than doubled our servers in the last year and then jumped up. We're managing, um, right now we're at 550 servers. And we expect to continue that rate of growth. And so the whole focus of Puppet was to be able to keep four people on our team, right, not have to spend more money and get everything under control. So along with those servers, we also had new services provided. We were rolling out Solar Cloud, Tomcat instances, um, Mule, Enterprise Service Bus instances. Um, and so you, we really couldn't be experts in all those different fields, right? But we needed to be able to provision everything very easily. And we needed to get away from all the manual configurations because with so much work to do, it just wasn't possible to accomplish it all manually. And because things had been done manually in the past, there's been a lot of drift right, that, that crept into our environment. So at the same time, we wanted to get all that under control under our legacy servers. And then we had this whole silo process where one team would stand up half of a server and then throw it over the fence and then wait for it to um, you know, configure the OS, throw it over the fence, the middleware guy, middleware guy would configure it and then throw it over the fence, maybe wait for some networking to get set up. And so the end user that was requesting the server would just he'd request and wait, essentially. Um, and you'd, you'd go through that process, and it'd take a week, two weeks to be able to get your servers delivered. And then also at ESPN, um, our team deals heavily with the movement of video. So your, your clouds don't really work for us. We can't stream HD video through Amazon, um, at least not cost effectively anyway. So we had to really look for something internal. Um, so with our project, there's a few things that we want to make sure that we had that we came out of it. Right, the holy grail push button configuration. Um, and I'm excited because we came very close to this. Um, Self-service for customers, get rid of those siloed process where people re uh, request and wait, but customers can just go and push the button and get their servers. Um, we wanted visibility into our state of configurations and past everything had been manually. We wanted to see you know, what, what was the drift out there so we could be able to correct it, have all the reports so you could hand it off to the proper people. Um, simplify our knowledge transfer. In any large IT business, you have people coming and going. Right? You, you want to have all of your knowledge of how things are built with inside of your code, not inside of people's head. So when somebody leaves, somebody can just come and read the code and, and understand all of your infrastructure. Uh, we want it to be all data driven. When we wanted to make changes to the environment, we just wanted to switch data. We didn't want to have to go write scripts and, and execute things on different nodes. And then, of course, Elastic, if we need more capacity, we could automatically just spin that up and then build, rebuild at any time. Um, this one's interesting here, too. Since we were, we were primarily an operations organization at the beginning, so we would handle the dev test environments, 
But we thought if we can provide a consistent dev test environments, why not take that to the workstation so our developers are developing an environment that's gonna be exactly like their prod and there's no surprises when they jump from their workstation to a dev test prod box. Allow ad hoc manual changes. Um, this is a requester from, request from my director who likes to still get on boxes and do things old school way. This is why I have the asterisks near there. It's kind of counterintuitive to Puppet, right? Uh, but, but there are situations in production where you realize that you did not configure something correctly and it breaks. And so you wanna be able to, to get on the box, be able to correct that. And then we wanna have our reports be able to tell us, you know, that's broken, you fixed it, now go back into your code, um, fix it in the code. And so then you bring all of your environments that that would have impacted up to date. Um, did not slow down development teams. We were in a position at ESPN where we have lots of different groups doing lots of different things and they're used to working in their own way. It, it wasn't feasible for us to tell everybody, hey, stop, we're gonna create this awesome pus puppet thing that's gonna make everything wonderful for your lives. We had to allow them to continue to, to deliver functionality because at the end of the day, that's what, that's what pays our bills. Um, then we wanted to backport everything, pull in our legacy servers, bring them up to date as well. Okay, here's your tra traditional SAS, PaaS, IS stacks. Right now we have Puppet imp implemented in the, the PaaS and the software layer. Uh, so that's what this presentation is gonna focus on, not doing anything on our infrastructure. Now, hopefully we'll have that next year. We are very early adopters of Puppet. We are implementing on the open source version, so we had no um, consulting from Puppet Labs, and we didn't have all their bells and whistles in the console. Um, effectively, our budget for this effort was zero. We had to implement this going along with all of our regular responsibilities. We did not have anybody dedicated to the project that could just sit there and focus. Um, so I, I think it's kind of a, a testament to the, the, the quality of Puppet that we were able to still implement and still do our regular jobs. And then I've just got the listing of the version of everything that we've implemented um, up there. And as you know, it's all very early 3.0 stuff and the community has moved on since then. Um, and they've put in a lot of fixes that we had to work around. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the data. When we were thinking about the data, we, you have this idea of facts, right? Things that you know that are true. And we, we broke this out into three different types of facts. So when I go through this presentation, I talk about facts, it's not just factor facts. Um, the factor facts are what we call our inherent facts. There's are things that exist just because a node exists, and that's what factor is gonna return for you. Then we have derived facts, and these are anything that can be figured out from any other facts that we have so that we don't have to assign them in any way. Um, and this is what we use the public custom functions for. A good example of a derived fact would be determining if a node is in a DMZ, right? We set up the network, we know which network segments in the DMZ, so we can just take the IP which is a fact of the node, uh, apply our business rules of how we set up our network, and then we can know that that box is in the DMZ. So we can automatically discover that. Um, and then assign facts. These, are, these really relate to our business rules. These are, we want this server, this node to be this, and so we can apply that information to. It's not something that we can just discover because things exist. So all the data that we have that, that drives our infrastructure is gonna be one of these types of facts. Um, here's the assigned facts that we came up with, a role, cluster, environment, and an owner, and we'll get into more details on these. Um, actually, let me talk a little bit about the owner. That's just so we know who owns the box so we can send out change notifications. You know, we got code deploys go out, you can notify the appropriate people, and then we use it for security delegation and then also licensing. If they want software on a box that they've got to pay for, we know who the owner is so we know who, to, uh, who, who should pay for it. And then these other things, I'm gonna go deeper into them as well. So, in our environment, um, what we want to manage? Everything, right? We're not doing a specific project. We're not doing a, a certain cluster of nodes. Um, we wanted to manage every single Linux server within inside the ESP environment. So up here, I've just got a representation of every single server, right? At this point, it really doesn't matter what they are, what they do. We just know we want to manage everything. Then we have this concept of role. So a role aligns with our business or IT needs. This is where we say this box is this role, this box is that role. Um, the role is gonna end up defining everything on a node. So we can just take a box, give it its role, and all the configurations are gonna be laid down. And there's exactly one role per node, and then this role includes profiles and releases. If you're familiar with the profile and role, um, 
the pattern. This is exactly this, and we've, we've done a little tweak to it um, with our releases, and we'll talk more about that as well. And then the ESPN role, of course, is the variable that we use throughout our puppet code for the role. So we take all our servers with inside the environment, and we group them out into roles. In this case, we have role A, B, C. Then we have our concept of our release environment. These are not puppet environments. Uh, they are determined by our application development and release lifecycle. So this is your dev, QA, production, and whatever your business wants to do, whatever environments that they want to have. And the ESP and ENV is our, our variable that we use within our puppet code to define those. So we go back to all of our servers, and then we divide them up through our release environment. Um, the work is our workstation. So this would be VMs actually running on somebody's laptop or um, desktop. And you got dev, QA, and prod. And of course, you can have whichever, whatever environment you want through there. And it's all dynamic too, right? Because it's just a variable, so we can just assign a, um, a new environment if we want to create a new one. Here we have the idea of clusters. Um, clusters are always going to be identical, and they're configured to interact with one another. These really came about for the need of TCP communication, where we had a statically defined list of the different nodes. And our variable that we use is ESPN cluster. And going back to all of our servers, uh, the colored boxes then are our clusters. Um, interesting thing here to notice is that you can have a single node in a single cluster. Right? It's going to have a cluster assigned to it, even though it doesn't participate with anybody else. So with this graph, um, we've divided up all our servers. This translates to our higher hierarchy. Okay? Um, this is how we, we do it in theory. Higher is used to. Um, set your data that you're going to use with inside your puppet modules, right? So if we create the hierarchy based on all of our servers within our network, we can always target specific nodes um, throughout our environment. So at the top, we have host name, which is the most specific. So we can always, if worse comes to worse, we can always target a specific node and say, I want this data on that node. Um, and then host name is most specific, and then we get um, greater to the least specific going down. So then a cluster, a role in our environment, um, network operating system, and then default down the bottom. If we, if we come back to here, you know there, there's, there's cross sections between the, the roles in the environments, right? We have QAB or, or DevB. There's going to be cases where the data that we want is going to intersect. We set a variable for, we want this variable to be this value of everything in Dev, but then you come along and say, I want that same variable to be the same across role B. You're going to have an intersection there. Um, so with inside of our hierarchy, we resolve this with that role environment where we basically append those together. So any place we have intersections um, in our hierarchy, we can always resolve them. Um, our default down here, this is where we actually put the values of our um, HIRA bindings. So whenever we create a module, it's going to go, the, the parameters that we set in there are going to be defined with inside of default. So, that's how we planned everything in theory to make sure that we could handle every single use case that could ever be thrown at us. And then this is what we have in practice. These are the actual overrides that we've had to use in our production to date. So that covers our data and how we, how we architect it. Are there any questions um, regarding this at this point? Yes. So um, a situation of view for that, um, say in production, say we, we've got a standard password for some utility that everybody uses, right? In production, we want that differently. Well, if it just happens that for a certain role, we need to switch that, we now have a conflict between the production password, which we want set everywhere, and the role that's being set. So there, there's the, uh, the intersection on that yellow box right there, right? So that if we come back to the hierarchy, we're going to have the value set with inside of the role and also inside of the environment. But which one should take precedence? Right? So we resolve that with the, uh, the role environment. Any other questions? OK. So that's how we define all of our data. So now we're going to look at the um, actual classification. So going back to our regular stack, um, We've got the role profile showing up again. And the profiles do, does all of our platform. So our profiles are going to lay down our JBoss instances. Um, and then our releases is from the application. So that's what we're going to use for developers to actually deploy you know, their WAR files, their EAR files. And I apologize. I speak everything in Java. Um, 
So that's what I do at ESPN. So the resource hierarchy, this, this is the way we um, viewed everything when we were developing how we're going to do our classification and make sure that we can always handle any situation that gets thrown at us. Basically, we think of everything as resources. They're not con configurations on a box. It's not a line inside of a file. Think of it in terms of resources. And then we start, um, you know, it makes a pyramid, and we build up by applying multiple resources inside of a class. Those classes go inside of profiles, um, and then releases would apply other resources, and then everything bubbles up to the single role. Um, resources are defined in modules, but are always used in our profile. We never apply um, modules directly to our environments. And two resources never manage the same configuration. That way we don't have conflicts when we run, right? If you applied two different profiles and they're using the same resource, um, but you had different data, maybe there would be conflicts there, so we want to avoid that. So we always, we always think in terms of resources, understand which module that should go under, and then he's only in one spot. So the modules are always gonna um, isolate our resources. They're never gonna reference another module. Um, everything is isolated 100% inside the module. Um, we put no organizational specific logic with inside that module. You probably heard a lot about um, pushing things to the forge and don't put stuff in there that other people don't wanna use. It's that exact same concept. Uh, we, we view the init PP, it really is just another class, so we view that as the minimal installer. If I'm throwing down JBoss, WebSphere, MQ, it's, you know, JBoss is just gonna be an unzip, unzip of the, the file that you would download. Um, very basic, nothing else that would go on it. Um, the point of the modules is really usab re reusability is key. We wanna be able to use it in, in any situation, no matter what. So this is just a, a representation of our resources. If you think, you know, that's every single resource that could be on a box that's managed, of course we're gonna have other configurations that maybe we'd, we don't care to manage on Puppet, so they're not gonna be defined as a resource. Um, and then we're gonna group all those inside of modules, and we're never ever gonna cross reference our modules, right? It's like Ghostbusters, don't cross your streams. Okay, so that's how we, we think about um, resources, and so then we're gonna bubble up to our profiles. Do we have any questions on those resources at all? Okay. Um, profile, the profile defines our platform, and here's where it's okay to, to cross-reference the, uh, the modules. So technically, the, our profile is implemented as a module, so then we've got classes in there that go out and they use the resources from all the other modules that we define. And this is also the place that we can enforce our dependencies between modules. As you're building your technology stack, you're gonna have certain versions that have to go along with other versions, and inside the profile, we can align those. Um, inside of our profile, we then use our class parameters to prevent the hierarchy overrides. And I'll give an example of this here. Um, this would be a portion of our uh, JBoss EAP6 profile. Once we lay this down, we have Apache, Java, JBoss, and the mod cluster version um, that all work together. And if you know anything about the way Red Hat does their subscription, they have certain stacks that have to be, you have to have certain versions and have to be supported. Um, so here we define all of our versions that we know have to go together in order to meet our uh, licensing agreement to get our support. And then we um, can go ahead and apply them. Um, any questions on this slide? Does this make sense? One interesting thing to note, I guess, up there, the, the parameters, I do have them, those values associated there, but in reality, in our code, they would be pulled off into that defaults file, and you would just refer them as profile JBoss EAP6, colon, colon, Java version, um, et cetera. But then by using, by passing them in, um, by defining those classes and setting them in as a parameter, that's gonna override Hiera. So somebody can't come in later and set a value on a specific host and change our Java version. Um, to something that's not supported, right? So then that allows us to enforce it. I see a lot of interesting looks on people's faces. Are we all good with this? And uh, I'm gonna try to run through this. They told me I got 40 minutes. Because um, I do wanna open it up for questions at the end because that's how we learn, right? Uh, so going on to releases. 
So release is a special type of profile, but, but it has all the same things that apply to a profile. Um, it also applies to a release, and it knows how to install on top of a profile. Um, and deploys our resources from an artifact hash, and I'll talk about this as a very um, interesting use case for uh, using an artifact hash. Uh, the release is gonna clean up any removed artifacts, so as we, our release versions change and we take and add things, Puppet is automatically gonna clean those up for us. Um, and then it's driven by a, a version release ID, and that ESPN release ID is just the variable we use with inside of our code. So it's artifact hash that I mentioned. Um, it, it's, it's a simple hash that defines the artif deployable artifacts. So this would be things like ear files, war files, um, properties files, uh, jar files, whatever you want to lay down as part of your version release as you uh, send code out to production. Uh, the artifact, it is uh, abstracted out, so it doesn't relate to any puppet resources directly. And then it also defines our contract between developers and operations groups. So within the types inside of our artifact hash is gonna tell developers what they're actually allowed to push out with their different versions. And then of course, you know, you would negotiate with inside your company of what you wanted inside of that release or not. And then this hash is profile agnostic. So this would be an example. Um, in this case, we can push out applications, ears, wars. Um, we also allow pushing out of data sources, which would do configurations on the middleware. And then you've got your utility stuff as well. So if anybody wanted to know what went out with a certain release, they would just look at this artifact hash and they would know all the deployable components that went out. Okay, so here's the example of um, one of our releases. Essentially at the, the very top, we take our ESPN release ID and then we query out that hash. And that release idea, ID is set with inside of the higher, um, hierarchy so that we can change it based on our release path, right? So our dev, test, production. And you can work with it, whatever release you want to work at. And then on your workstation, developers would have the ability to change that to any version they want so they would work on future releases. Um, so we pull back that hash and then just for brevity's sake, so I can fit it on a slide I took out, basically we're gonna munge that data and make it work with our environment. We're gonna have all of those deployable artifacts sitting out somewhere, right? So if you're doing Maven, you might have it in a Nexus repository. Um, so essentially we, we then configure that hash so that we can pass it to create resources and it knows where to go pull those, um, those deployable artifacts. Down the bottom, so you see two sections. First we have our resources, uh, JBoss 7 data source purge equals true. This cleans up anything that's not inside of our release. So if a data source no longer is being used, it's taken out of the release, it's gone from our environment. Um, and then we go ahead and create everything that is inside of our release as well. And then we essentially just replicate those two lines for all the different types of artifacts that we want to support. So down below there um, is our applications, be able to push out applications, and of course you'd have jars and, and everything else that you wanted to do. Does this make sense to everybody? Questions? Ideas, thoughts? Yes. So right now we actually have both um, in there. In the future we will separate those out. Um, it's actually one of the things that kind of bugs me about Puppet is that the, the higher implementation is just a singleton. I'd prefer to have different hierarchy trees to go pull stuff from. Um, yes, but so essentially, uh, if you, actually when we get to our site PP, I'll show you where we pull, um, how we get that actual release ID. Yeah, so, so if you look at these resource lines, the first thing you'll see, you'll see the JBoss 7 underscore data source. That's a custom provider that, okay. that we've developed. So, down that road too. what's that? We went down that road as well. So, and I'd be interested in people's feedback that have also go to, gone down that road. Um, and, and hopefully we're working through legal right now to be able to uh, release that JBoss provider that actually goes against the APIs instead of just lay down files. Okay, so now we've got our platform um, as a service. We've got our software as a service, so then we can lay it down to a box, so that's where we're gonna bubble it up to a role. And then here's our example role. Um, we lay down a whole bunch of profiles and then put our release on top of it. So that code right there lets us build um, a box that's going into our production studios. Is there any question on this? 
Okay, so let's go to our um, site PP. This is where we actually do the classification. And notice very at the top, we go and we go query some extra data. And so this is right here. We go into Hiera and we pull out the ESP and release ID. Um, that gives us the version of the release that we want to go to, and then we use that value to then go back and query the, uh, the artifact hash within inside of the, the, the release manifest. Um, and then we come down and we actually do our classification. We just have no default, so everything is going to include the role that's assigned to them. So then what, let, what this lets us do is when we want to create a new server, that's everything right there that we need to be able to completely configure a server. We're going to give it its name. We're going to specify which cluster it's in, which role, and then which environment we want it in. So those are all the assigned facts, right? If we went back to the beginning of, of our data, those are the assigned facts because we want the server to be like that. Um, so if we think about standing up a, a new JBoss cluster, I can use whatever server names I want. And if I, technically, I could actually automate the server name if I just wanted computer-generated names, right? Um, just give it a new cluster. And then my role over there would be a role that includes that JBoss profile. And then really, we come down. That Add button right there is going to be our button. Uh, th at this point, it's our configuration. In the future, when we implement the infrastructure as a service, it'll be our provisioning, right? So along with these as assigned facts, we would also have you know, how much CPU, how much RAM do you want it, what availability center do you want it in, click the button, it provisions it, it configures it, and you automatically have your server. Um, yeah, so at this point, um, we can just pull somebody off the street, and they can build our servers with that much knowledge. Any questions at this point? Yes. Roles. We are up to, I would say we're about 25 right now, different roles. The, so, so the roles are actually, they're implemented as, um, as manifests inside of a module. So we have a role module that has each role then has a manifest, right? That assembly defines this. And this is just our in internal GitHub, GitHub that we keep it in, right? So we just use the Git flow for developing. Questions on the classification? That'll make sense to everybody? OK. So moving on to M Collective. I've got 12 minutes, so I'm going to try to, to go through this fairly quickly. Um, Anybody know Colonel John Boyd? So we've got one person to raise his hand. So I'm, you're probably familiar with the OODA loop then as well. So uh, John Boyd was a military strategist. Um, one of the things that, that he came up with um, was an OODA loop or decision cycle. And the whole idea is that you can um, observe your environment and then make decisions based on those observations and then act upon them. Very simple in concept, but very powerful when you start applying it to IT. And actually, for him, he applied this to fighter jets. And it was his theories and a few other people that he worked with that were the influence of the F-16, F-18 series um, of fighter jets. And this is his OODA loop, the observe, orient, and decide, and act. Um, as I'm talking about M Collective, I'm actually going to map it to this. Because this is a whole theory of how you do things fast, how you get things done, how you understand what you're doing as you're getting it done. Um, and the OODA loop can be applied not only in, in warfare, but also in sports. And, and here I'm applying it to our IT business, because in your IT, you want to you be able to adapt as change as fast as you can. You want to be able to understand that change. And M Collective has been able to let us do this. Uh, talking about the OODA loop, the important thing here is time. Um, this is uh, Harry Hillaker. He's one of the designers of the F-16. And, uh, here he's talking about, actually, fighter pilots of how they use an engagement. Um, that you're always going to win if you can execute your OODA loop cycle faster than your opponent. Because what's going to happen is you're going to change their environment, and they're going to get in a state where they're just responding to you instead of actually doing anything productive. All right, they're not going to go all the way through and complete the act cycle. They're going to get in here into their decision and hypothesis. You've done something differently. Now they've got to change. So they've got to go in the feedback and go all the way back to their observations. And so, so if we apply this to business, this is a, when you get in your opponent's OODA loop cycle, you're essentially 
um, you know, you're producing game-changing or innovative technologies that keeps everybody else adapting to what you're doing. So with inside of ESPN, um, we look at this with Puppet. So I guess the first thing I should state inside of our Orient, um, this is where you do all your analysis upon your, your observations. This is kind of your, your DevOps group, right? You want to bring as much knowledge to that group as possible so that you can best understand all the conditions that are around you and you can make the appropriate decisions. And then we figure out what we're going to do, and then we run our hypothesis. Um, this is where we have a, a feedback loop with our Puppet runs in our dev and test Puppet environment. So this is developing modules. Um, we use mCollective to do all, all of our Puppet runs. Um, so we can we basically de de develop in a Puppet environment and then kick off our uh, mCollective Puppet run against our test servers where we're developing our modules. And then we get our feedback to be able to say, you know, did we get the results that we want? And we can do all our testings in that environment as well. And then once we know that our modules are good, right, we're going to do, go ahead and push them into production. But when we push them into production, we want to understand what that impact is going to be on our production, first of all. Um, and this is where we have our no-op puppet runs on, in production. So we can freely promote code into our production, and we, do, we don't have Puppet automatically apply anything. Um, we always put it out there with no op runs so that we can understand what it's actually going to change first. And we have these no op Puppet runs um, running hourly on cron currently on all our environments. Um, so, that, so right now, within every single hour, we know that our entire environment is exactly the way we want it, or we know what's out of sync and what needs to be addressed. So if you think about visibility into your environment, um, that's where it's at right there. And then the dashboard, of course, can display any nodes that aren't responsive anymore. Something went wrong with them collective, something the network went down, and you're not getting communicated. So you may not know what that state is. The dashboard's going to be able to flag that for you. So once we do the no-op run, we understand our changes, and we say, yes, that's exactly what we want. Then we go ahead, and we can do the no-op no run within um, mCollective to push out the changes everywhere. And then that's going to show up on the, the dashboard and um, feedback into our obs op observations into our environment, because now our environment has changed with the new code that's gone out. So this is the, the simple process that we use to apply the configuration changes. We always do a no-op first, and we always target the nodes with filters that we want to push to. Um, and we always use tags to push just the resources that we want to go out. Um, and we, once we validate everything, we, we apply it with a no-no-op. So down the bottom here, this is actually an mCollective command um, that I used recently. This essentially, we're going to do a no-op run um, using a filter for the class of JBoss EAP6. And then we tag our um, init script in any place that has GAP6. So this, this essentially pushed out our initd start script for JBoss. We um, put in some code to purge out some directories. And so with that single script, I updated every single JBoss EAP6 server um, throughout our environment with one command. So in the UDA loop, the thing that really gets exciting is this implicit guidance control up here, right? These are things that we can do um, automatically. We don't have to think about, we don't have to test. We see a condition, we know what action should we take, so just, just go ahead and do it. Um, I don't know if anybody was at the, uh, the talk from GitHub um, last night where he was talking about his, his feedback and they have their little computer that just goes and does things and how it makes his life wonderful as a DevOps. This is the same idea, right? Um, we can get alerts from our, our dashboards, our monitoring systems, and do analysis of what action should be taken and then use mCollective to actually execute that action across all of the nodes. So if you think about you know, servers getting pounded heavily, starting to have slow response, we can then, because we have all our data that analyzes our that knows what nodes in the cluster, we can say this node's having a problem in this cluster. Make sure all the other nodes are good. If they are and they can handle the traffic, go ahead and pull that node out of service, rebounce it, take diag diagnostics, whatever you want to do, and then go ahead and place it back in service. And so you can create that automatic feedback loop using mCollective um, to automate basically your, what your operations guys do. So and if I had the time, I would take a heavy look at uh, complex event processing for those that are familiar with that, to be able to analyze the data of the events that are coming out of your environment, and then use them collective to push all the commands that take action. So that's the, that's the way we're running our environment right now. So doing our 
2020 hindsight, what would we do differently? Um, we would definitely Im implement M Collective first. Uh, we already had Puppet out and running when we went back and put in M Collective. We ran into some issues with our firewalls. Um, that our, our availability had problems at first. And once we were moving to M Collective to do all of our Puppet runs, it became kind of a pain. Um, and again, we were early adapters here, so all the documentation online wasn't up to date. I've since gone back and looked over, and it looks like everything is there now. So I'm sure if you implement now, everything would be much smoother than, than what we had. But I would definitely do that first and get in the habit of using um, M Collective to actually manage your uh, environment. Plan for developer dashboards. This effort was really launched out of the um, Linux and Middleware Services team. Once the developers um, heard about it, they're like, yeah, we want to have visibility into our production environment as well. They were having difficulty with the releases not going always as smooth as they thought they should. Um, you know, properties files went missing and whatnot. And so they wanted to actually be able to see what was in their environment. Um, so they started clamoring to get all the puppet reports as well. So we, we would definitely plan for that from the get-go. And then if you think about this architecture, the one thing that we are missing is able to do classification based on the ESPN environment. So the other day, we had somebody come to us and say, hey, I've, really, I've written this cool Node.js application, and I want to um, host it on our dev servers. But with Puppet right now, we don't have a single way, a simple way to push it out just to their dev server, right? We would push it out to that role, which then automatically gets propagated to their dev test and production servers. Um, so our, our next step is going to be to implement a custom ES, uh, ENC so that we can have that flexibility to do classification based on the ESPN environment. Um, and nice to haves. Since we do a lot with video, we do a lot of shared file systems. Um, it'd be really nice if we can do puppet runs across multiple nodes. So we do one puppet run, and it would update this node, and then um, it would update uh, the second node as well. Uh, resources automatically tagged with catalog unique identifiers. When you go and you push a single resource using the tags in M Collective, it, it's going to search the catalog essentially to find which resources you actually want to apply. And so it's your responsibility to make sure that's unique so that you're applying only what you want to. Um, but the, the, um, the titles of the resources are already unique with inside of the uh, catalog. So if M Collective just supported that in their tags, it'd be super easy to push the exact resources that you wanted um, and wouldn't have to worry about accidentally getting other stuff. Then, of course, role-based access control for our dashboards. Um, so Puppet Lab says they're working on it. We hope to see it soon. So that, that was our experience of going from 0 to 60 with Puppet. So at this time, are there any questions? So we, we first started looking serious at it um, last September. And so our, our initial was really figuring things out. We didn't t have anybody to tell us this is how you do it. So you know, we would go out and we would, we would look online and we would see stuff like uh, the params pattern or a truth enforcer pattern. Then you'd, you'd read debates, you know, which one's better. And so it was kind of confusing. So we had to go through and test all of that, right? Um, so we started that back in September. We got to, it was late December about when we finally decided, OK, this is the direction we want to go on. And then it was February by the time that we said, yes, we're confident in this architecture. We're going to declare victory and, and push forward using that as our strategy. Yeah, um, I guess I, I missed it a minute ago. You said uh, custom ENC. I'm curious uh, what, what um, you were looking to do that you couldn't do with, say, some custom facts to determine your ESPN environment and HIRA. Um, so it really comes down to classification. So we could probably pull it off with um, Hira and do the classification that way. Um, that would be possible. The other driver behind getting to a custom ENC is actually the, those uh, assigned facts. These guys right here, that right now they're currently actually going into the dashboard, just a natural evolution of learning the product. We want to get off of that because then we want to expose the dashboard to all developers, but we don't want to have the possibility of them setting up data. So there's a little more driver, but um, yes, with Hira, It'll probably be possible. Okay. Cool. Next question. Looks like we've got 26 seconds. Uh, yes.
So, actually, could you repeat the beginning of your question? Right, so, so, so fixing something is not necessarily inside of your configuration. Um, right, so, so JVM runs out of memory, right? They want to hop on there, and then maybe you just had that outage, and then you're like, oh, well, maybe we should take heap dumps into a certain directory. You go ahead and just apply those parameters, and then on, on that node, so if it happens again, you can get your diagnostics that you want, right? And so then once you've made that change, then inside of our no-op reports, we say, oh, this node has these values, and so then we can say, oh, well, we want that everywhere in our environment, and then you would go back into your, your puppet code and actually apply it everywhere. So, yeah, yeah we, just want, we didn't want to be in a situation where things were down. So it's really re return for service, and where things were down and then have to go into our puppet code to update everything, right? We just wanted to get it up quick. All right, if there's no more questions, thank you very much.